All right, well, in the interest of starting on time, it's 4 p.m. Sydney time. My name is Brett Kelly, the founder and CEO of Kelly Partners Group Holdings, and I'm joined by Kenneth Coe, our group CFO. We've got a short presentation to, um, to share with you today that we shared this morning. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to taking some questions at the end. Um, I try my headphones for a little bit better sound. All right. Let's do that, Kenny. Let's do KPG in 10 seconds. We've been publishing this panel for some years now, and I think it's an easy way for people to quickly be able to see the performance of the business. Over the last nearly 17 years, we've focused on growing opportunity for our people because this is a business that, to the degree that it can provide great opportunities for people, will, it, will continue to attract, develop, and retain amazing people. So 42.2% revenue growth in an industry that's growth is, is uh, not that, is um, I think a really great effort by the team with a very strong organic component as well. Our margin is compressed um, for a moment. If you look down the bottom of, of the screen, the practice uh, margin's 30% and we've made heavy additional investments at the um, services business level, at the group level. Our underlying NPAD A growth is up 7.5% on the prior year. Um, and we're very pleased with that progress. Our balance sheet, um, return on equity and net debt to underlying EBITDA. So return on equity, we think is still very strong at 43.4%. And our balance sheet gearing is still very moderate. Cash flows up 12%. Cash conversions up 17% to over 100% in the period. Um, uh, these are highly cash generated businesses uh, that are growing very strongly with, I think, quite unlimited opportunity. On the next page, we, we love Will, Will Thorndike's book, The Outsiders. It has a framework for capital allocation that we draw your attention to here. Um, we want to improve the earning power of our operating businesses. Our margin still are more than 50% higher than the average in Australia and, and the US and UK. Uh, we're further increasing our earnings through acquisitions. Um, we're growing uh, very, very strongly. We're growing our existing businesses strongly. We're growing our existing complementary businesses, making programmatic acquisitions at an increasing cadence, making an occasional large acquisition, none, none in the last three years, so they will be occasional. And um, we'll repurchase shares from time to time. We're pleased that the number of shares on, issues, on issue remains constant at 45 million. So three big buckets we, we're going to talk, speak about today. I'll talk about growth. Kenny will talk about um, financials and we'll talk about um, the growth plan over the next five years. Um, uh, the business today is a growing business um, that is very profitable on a day, daily basis and can, can continue to fund its own growth indefinitely without um, raising capital or issuing new shares, although the opportunity um, at, at any point to do those things, if it makes sense, would be considered. Um, our number of offices has grown strongly. We're growing strongly into Queensland now and Victoria and globally into Hong Kong and the US. There's a strong opportunity to take our playbook um, and pursue global growth. I'll talk more about that later in the presentation. In terms of our growth in acquisitions, um, the cadence continues um, to grow. Um, you can see the number of acquisitions in each five-year period, six and then eight, and now 27. Um, we believe that we can materially accelerate that over time while focusing on a programmatic acquisition approach. Our revenue and EBITDA growth um, continue to grow. The business has doubled five times over its lifetime. Um, at different periods. On average, I think about every three and a bit years, um, we expect that that trend can be maintained for a long time, which is exciting. In terms of revenue growth and EPS growth, you'll see that um, on the next page, compounded annual growth rates in so six of 30%, earnings per share, annual growth rates since IPO 13.1%, strong growth in 
accounting complementary and, and acquisitions during the period. Growth in owner earnings, I'll leave uh, for you to refer to, but owner earnings continue um, to CAGR strongly. Our per share growth is growing strongly. Um, and our return on invested capital. Um, I think you can see on the next page is, is you know, very, very strong. I just call out the, the sort of methodology we're using there. Average 2018 to 2022 uh, return on invested capital of 26%. We think that's okay. Um, and we've traded this business through um, a global financial crisis um, in 08, 09, a pandemic. Um, now, you know, we, I think the first acquisition that we made was funded at 11.1% interest rate. So we, we understand interest rates. Um, and so an average of, of ROIC plus organic revenue growth of 31%, we think is, is not only quite good, but, but maintainable for the foreseeable future um, and, and likely the very long term. Um, now, our people, services and clients, um, we have again been nominated a great place to work by our, by our 456 team members. Our services are, um, I think, easy to understand. I would call out that, you know, our aim is to be in the top 10 firms in Australia and grow globally. Uh, the firms that are larger than us today and some that are smaller have a much larger proportion of audit and a test type work. We aim to keep audit under 5% of our revenue. In terms of clients, um, our net promoter score at 70 um, is as high as an accounting firm that we're aware of um, in the world. Um, and our client group numbers continue to grow, which we think is a very powerful, interesting group of people that we've brought together as clients. And I'll hand over to you, Kenny, to talk about the financials. Thanks, Brad. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to see everyone again and present the financial results for the half year. Um, the first slide here is the highlights of the half year, uh, which, as Brett said, a significant increase in our group revenue from 30.9 million to 44 million, uh, being a 42.2% increase on the prior year, mainly driven by the increased number of acquisitions we completed in the second half of 2022 and in the, in the current half year. Uh, underlying EBITDA for the group has also increased 14.3% compared to the prior half. Um, and the percentage increase in revenue has no, not flown through completely to the bottom line, mainly due to a drag on the margins from our recently acquired businesses, which we'll cover in a later slide. And as Brett mentioned, the additional investments we have made uh, from the parent entity to support our, our accelerated, accelerated growth and our expansion globally. Uh, underlying NPAT A for the parent has uh, increased 7.5% to 3.6 million. Uh, and uh, I'll leave most of the other metrics for you to review at your own time, as most of these will cover off either in later slides um, in the deck. And uh, most of the metrics are either up on the prior year uh, as a result of the growth of the business or comparable to the prior year. Uh, in terms of revenue growth, as we've covered many times now, organic 7.8%. Acquired revenue growth of 34.5%, with a total revenue growth of 42.2%. Uh, in terms of the income statement, uh, we've covered the revenue and EBITDA margins in the previous highlight slide. A couple of things I wanted to note in this year's number, you'll see that the statutory numbers are mostly down on last year, whereas the underlying numbers are up. Uh, and the reason for that is because in the last half year, the prior half year, we received government grants in relation to COVID-19, which has inflated the statutory numbers. And uh, we exclude those numbers, obviously, from our underlying analysis. Um, underlying NPAT A attributed to its shareholders increased as a result of our strong revenue growth and acquisition activities, uh, and is offset by the additional investments in the parent entity. Uh, depreciation and amortization there has increased significantly, mainly because of our acquisitions and also increases in the right of use assets from the new offices that we've added into the group. Um, as Brett has covered off previously, we've added nine offices since 31st December 2021, uh, which is, a, which is a, a large increase and hence the increase in the depreciation in those right of use assets. Uh, finance costs also has increased considerably, uh, but that is impacted by non-cash accounting entries, again, relating to acquisitions and new leases. If we exclude that, the cash finance costs 
increased by 600,000, mainly because of the debt that we've taken out to fund the acquisitions and a generally high interest rate due to the macroeconomic environment. On to the next slide, gross margins, uh, as we've you know, presented previously, we present this slide to show our gross margins compared to other listed market participants. You'll see that uh, in this year, our gross margin is at 58%. We'd like that to improve to more than 60% like our previous years, um, uh, but that's impacted by a higher cost of sales from uh, the recently uh, completed acquisitions. And we continue to integrate and transform those acquired businesses. In terms of profitability, this is a, a slide that gives you a breakdown by the EBITDA margins into cohorts. Um, as mentioned earlier, the total EBITDA margin of all our operating businesses, excluding the parent uh, additional investment is 30% for the half year, um, excluding the acquired businesses, which you'll see there generating 20.9% EBITDA margins. Our, our EBITDA margins is 31% for the existing uh, businesses. Um, and uh, again, if you look at that breakdown, you'll see growth and subscale businesses, which are defined as those with annual revenues less than 2 million and 1 million. Uh, to, to have EBITDA margins of 21.6% and 22.3% respectively. We continue to focus, one, on scaling up the, those growth and subscale businesses, and two, to transform those acquired businesses to achieve the high EBITDA margins. Um, as Brett said, we're still comparatively much more profitable than the average accounting business in the industry, uh, as shown in that graph there, with the average accounting business generating EBITDA margins of only 19%. Uh, in terms of the NPAT A reconciliation, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the prior year, you'll see us deducting that one off government grants in relation to COVID-19 to arrive at that underlying number. And you'll see that that statutory NPAT is higher because of that reason. Uh, in this half, we've mainly added back just the acquisition costs in relation to the six acquisitions we've completed this year. Having a look at our core measures of WIP, debtors, lockup day and cash conversion, compared to the prior year, you'll see that our measures are, are very comparable to the prior year, even though we've made uh, a lot of acquisitions. Our lockup this half is at 56.4 days compared to the prior half at 57.4 days, and cash conversion is very high at 106.4%. Revenue growth much higher than the previous half year because a lot of the acquisitions were completed, uh, were completed in the second half of financial year 22 and in this half. In terms of the balance sheet, um, lockup days continues to be managed tightly as, as we covered off in the previous slide. Uh, our gearing ratio has increased to 1.93 times underlying EBITDA. Um, although I think a more meaningful measure is underlying EBITDA of our operating businesses, which excludes the parent additional investment, um, then that uh, gearing ratio is 1.61x, as you can see in, in the slide. Our group RE and parent RE continues to be very strong and our assets and borrowings have increased due to the acquisitions. In terms of debt and liquidity, our net debt increased 5.5 million since 30th of June, mainly to fund our in-year in acquisitions and also partner buy-ins into the business, both existing partners and new partners. We still maintain a significant headroom of 15.1 million in cash and undrawn facility limits. Um, as we've kind of covered off previously, although the debt has increased, um, we're not concerned at all. We're paying those debts, acquisition debts back at four to five years. Uh, and you'll see this in, in the cash flow slide that we'll cover off uh, in the next two slides. Net debt per, per partner increased marginally uh, to 520K. At 30th of June, it was slightly above 500K. And that's because even though we've increased the debt acquisitions, debt from acquisitions, We've also grown the number of part of our partners considerably as well. Um, so, so that the number of equity partners as at 31st of December is 72. And we've further added four new partners since then. In terms of the cash flow, uh, our cash from operations increased 12.2%. Uh, our free cash flow you'll see there is main is basically constant. Uh, consistent with the prior half year. And that is what I spoke about in the in that debt slide. We're applying all our profits from the acquisitions into debt reduction. So the free cash flow there is basically consistent with what it was in the prior year. Uh, and um, again, it's good to see in that table there, you'll see that we've drawn 7.7 .7 million, but we've also, uh, in the same period, we've repaid 5.3 million, 
which is the addition of the scheduled debt reductions and the additional debt repayments in that slide. In terms of dividends, in the first half, we've paid final dividends and special dividends relating to FY22. Uh, and in total for FY22, we've paid 8.17 cents per share, which amounts to a dividend payout ratio of 58.4%. And it's in line with our dividend policy. We continue to pay monthly dividends and we've increased our monthly dividends again by 10% this year. And the remaining slides I'll leave for you to uh, uh, read yourselves uh, as they're, they're basically answers to common questions we get asked around parent, NCI, splits, cash reconciliations, first half and second half SKUs, et cetera. Over to you, Brett. Thanks, Kenny. Appreciate that. Um, uh, on to the next slide, if you can, KK. It's worth having a read of a book called The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman. We believe that professional services um, as the work from home trend continues and the use of technology accelerates will become a global business. And so, you know, my quote here is that it's difficult to justify um, an in the investment required to run a world-class organization and deliver a world-class people, climate, community impact um, that we've become known for um, if you don't grow um, globally. Our clients over the next 25 years are all going to have, a, have to earn a return on a global basis and will need their accounts to help them operate in this new global world. An, an interesting observation I'll just share on the next two slides uh, is that while Australia is the 13th largest um, economy in the world, um, there is no accounting firm that's a global um, Australian accounting firm. And so while the US um, had Coopers and Lightbrand and the UK had, um, or had Pricewaterhouse, China, Shine Wing, Japan, Deloitte, Germany, KPMG. Um, India is, is building, or trying to build a, a, a global firm. Mazars is a very large global firm from France. MNP, less known, out of Canada. It just hasn't been. It's like Australia's a tributary state of the world for accounting services. And Australians are a global population, a high net worth business owning and building entrepreneurs of Australia are building businesses around the world and their accountants aren't helping them do that. We think as a big hairy audacious goal over the next 25 years that we can be that firm. We're calling that out as a differentiated market opportunity. Um, if we've got the team to get up and go to actually get in and, and make that happen. We'll start by taking small sort of asymmetric bets in the UK and the US where we've opened an office um, in California a group office where we're looking to open a group office in the UK. We think we can, you know, to re reference Manish Pabrai's Dando Investor book, take very small bets with, you know, massive asymmetric upside. If we can take our playbook for partnering and improving accounting firms into those markets, then the US is 15 times the size of Australia and it looks like the UK is, is, is certainly some multiple the size of Australia. So we won't say too much more than that other than to, to indicate that we have a business system. It's not just an accounting firm. Um, while KPG owns a 51% interest in 27 accounting firms, um, uh, KPG itself is not an accounting firm. It's an expert partner to accounting firms that bring system processes and insight um, to help them perform better um, and better reward their partners, their people, and make a more positive impact in their community. So that's where we see the, the real opportunity. We've been supported in that by our major shareholders who, who've encouraged us to have a good look at that. Um, we've spent a lot of time investigating those markets. I guess the other insight I would share is that if you psychometrically profiled as we do, the people that we recruit, but you also did that in the US, Canada, New Zealand, and the UK, you'd find that the psychometric profile of an accounting professional is virtually exactly the same. In fact, when I've attended conferences in the US, that, you know, other than the accent, accountants are, are expressing and experiencing virtually the same professional experience. Um, we think we can add a huge amount of value in that context. And there's a number of people who are shareholders who, who share that view. Um, uh, what I want to assure people is that 
the two major risks that I perceive are one that we would overinvest capital where we get no return. Um, I think over the last 17 years, our team has a very strong track record of getting a return on our capital, um, but we'll be very, very careful um, and prudent by first bullets and then cannonballs. We'll look to buy small firms and improve them um, and then do, do other things. Um, so a programmatic acquisition methodology will continue. And secondly, um, if we became distracted from the core business of growing Australia at 5% organic, 5% via acquisition, you can see again in the prior period of a growth rate well in excess of our long promised five and five. We think we can continue that, that we've invested in a strong team and a strong understanding as to, to how to do this business. Um, but time will tell and we'll be prepared to, uh, to share the results on a, on a very transparent, um, even-handed basis. Um, so I, I'm here with Ken and we're pleased to, um, to take any questions. I think there's a Q&A box that, that we can use. Here's a couple of questions coming through. Um, I'll just start answering them as, as they pop up, if you pop them in. Um, Leon, does KPG aspire over time to compete for big four clients at the top, of, top end of town? So two part question here, um, definitely not. If I wanted to, you know, I started my career at Price Waterhouse. I've always said, I think the big, the big four are, are the big four. I'm not sure that, the, that they are the excellent four for private clients. So we want to maintain a focus on what we call driven, successful private business, business owning entrepreneurs are often first and second generation um, that are get up early, stay up late driven types of people that, that respond to, to, to that energy that they get from us. I hope that answers that question. Jack Hayes, um, with increased number of firms under the KPG umbrella, do you have any concerns about being to, able to manage these firms? And ensure that the quality they provide to their customers remains constant. Um, and two parts there, Jack. Um, we expect that we can continue to run what are called partner owner driver model firms. We've been awarded the trademark of that term that we invented and have rigorously applied now to numerous transactions. Every single one of our partner, partnerships is where we own more than 50% and the partners own the balance of, and are the operating partners. We don't run firms. We partner with partners who are owners and drivers. We get under those firms and support them to do their best work. Um, and we are completely aligned to the, to the values and behaviors of, of the people that we bring in. And so we're very careful about that. Um, we don't think that the number of firms um, is, is difficult. In fact, there are numerous very large global firms that are managing um, their situations well. Um, so it's been done before in our industry. Um, we think we can, we can do a very good job of that over time, emphasizing that you know, we're not in a rush. Um, Stephen Mab, thank you for your question. Um, congrats on the strong revenue growth and especially the organic growth. Revenue grew considerably more than profit for the half. Can you please add some clarity to which significant costs have been increasing more than revenue and which of these you'd expect to drop going forward? So Stephen, we've invested about one and a half million primarily across um, brand digital and global workforce. You'll hear much more about that um, in the coming, coming months and years. Um, if you look back at where we have um, invested above our 9%, our 6.5% services fee and 2.5% IP fee, about four years ago, we invested a similar number that helped us very materially grow the business. Um, we don't expect that they are, or well, we know for certain that they're not recurring expenses. Um, they're largely one-off investments where we think that the, you know, the long-term return is huge. We see ourselves as stewards of the capital of the business. Um, and I guess the difference between KPG and, and our mindset and some others is we've always had a you know, 25 year view of every dollar that we invest, trying to build a hundred year great organization. So we're investing to make that happen. We're very confident, but um, that that will uh, prove to be money well invested. Um, and I'll note that Stephen, I'm 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 very uh, 
uh, considerably invested in the group. And so half of that money is my money. Um, and I feel very comfortable about the investments that we've made. Um, Ed Vesley, uh, what are the drivers behind the half's organic growth rate? We have built genuinely a powerful brand that is attractive to excellent firms that want to become part of something bigger than themselves and ideally better than themselves. When people get to a point where they've done everything they can to really develop their business and can see that we can help them take their business to the next level, um, then we've got really good inbound inquiry continually um, from stronger and stronger firms. Um, and, um, uh, and so you know, the acquisition pipeline has, has always been something that we have, have pursued over nearly 17 years. Um, and so people come to us directly. I think we've done two deals out of 65 plus through brokers. Um, most of the firms that, that join us don't, even, don't ever even go on the market through a broker. Um, and I'm incredibly pleased with the quality of people that are coming to us. I take up the opportunity there to explain, Ed, that there are three businesses that I find very inspiring. One is Berkshire for obvious reasons, but I think what people often overlook is that Warren Buffett has become the first choice buyer for people with amazing businesses. They feel great to have sold to Berkshire. They even write books about how they sold to Berkshire. Our humble ambition, if we can submit it in that tone, is that over the next 25 years, we want Kelly Partners Group Holdings to be the organisation that people who have spent their lives building amazing businesses, rather than flip them out you know, to a private equity firm to be bought and sold, will choose to partner in a partner owner driver manner with Kelly Partners Group Holdings, who, you know, are a listed permanent capital style organization in the in the sort of heritage of Berkshire. I'm also very inspired by Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy, where Bernard Arnault has bought into businesses that he knows have multi hundred year profiles. But he's brought into these heritage brands and re-energized those brands via modern leadership and management. But most importantly, he's out been prepared to out invest his competitors because he can see 25 years out rather than 25 minutes. And finally, Constellation Software, who you know share our love of programmatic acquisition, which is you know many two to five million dollar acquisitions um, over a long period of time where we don't do things for empire building or size. Um, we do things where we think we can get an appropriate economic return and make impact to it, our you know, partners, people, clients, and, um, and communities. Stephen Mab, um, it's great to have an aligned founder and the Kelly operating model and expansion plans all sound exciting. My, my question is, who is your backup? The plan is to expand internationally. Who'll be the leader on the ground domestically if you're off globally or vice versa? Having first-hand experience of this is very difficult for even a great leader to lead people in execution to different countries and time zones at the level you aspire to. Having to sure you keep that NPS going in different global geographies. Great question, Stephen, thank you. Um, uh, we have a team of partners, 75 plus partners who are owners and drivers of their businesses. We support that team through our services. While it's you know very flattering to be called a leader, um, Stephen, your leadership is followed by your follow, you know, is defined by your fellowship, you know, by who wants to go on the adventure with you um, and play in a manner that aligns with your mission, values, and vision. I'm incredibly proud of the partners that we have. I think often they're overlooked, and you know, people have said to me for many years, "Well, what happens if you're not there?" Well. If I'm moving around a little bit more, as I have for many, many years, I've been outside Australia for 16 weeks a year, every year for a decade, and no one's noticed. Um, I think I was ski for three months a couple of years ago, um, and no one noticed that um, the company performed incredibly well. Um, then, you know, we have 75 leaders who own 49% of their businesses. Now we have a services team where we have seven senior professionals across people, IT, finance, risk, legal, et cetera, um, who are more than capable um, and are similarly aligned to deliver um, in their um, roles. I'm incredibly um, pleased with these people and I'm quietly confident in their ability to, to manage and execute um, their roles. 
time zones are a little bit of fun. Often as a CEO, you can get um, dragged into minutiae that's best um, managed by other people. Um, moving around has always been my way of managing that. Um, NPS, we still have a, a strong and, and improving um, quality review process for our, our partners, but our people are, uh, are pleased. Um, and um, I, I, you know, I, I couldn't be more proud or pleased with the quality of our people and their, you know, their values and behaviour, um, the difference that they make to the clients. We see it in the NPS surveys live on screens in our offices. It's really, frankly, very, very inspiring to me. I can't see any reason why our people won't continue to behave the way they always have. To Janil, US is only an expansion office today. That's right, I'm not an accounting office port yet. We have made some offers on some firms over here. We're pursuing due diligence. We've got a, a group um, office up and running. Our first team member will be here on the 27th of February. Um, we've appointed US bank lawyers um, and m and advisors. So um, you know, we're well down the track of this 12 and a half thousand target firms in California. We'd like to buy We'd like to meet 10% of them, 1,250 of them. We'd like to buy 10% of that, 125. And if we do badly, we may do okay. But we'll do that by following our dando mindset of, you know, heads we win, tails we don't lose. We'll continue to just structure the things we do very carefully and very diligently and, and, and with a risk-first mindset. Karen, can we expect a drip plan to directly reinvest dividends on our behalf? Uh, that's a very good question. I'll have to come back to that. I, I, I don't have thinking in that in that direction, but we, you know, I, I, I've been clear that we will ultimately try and pursue a, um, a uh, you know, a global strategy of growing in the UK. We are going to move our longest serving, most senior partner into the London market by the end of March with an office, a group office. So we will have our people on the ground uh, making things happen. And, and the specifics about dividend reinvestment, I'll come back to. Zach Joyce, hey, Brent and Co, great work, guys. Good to see the focus shine through. Can you add some insight into the investment in the services team we've made? Um, is this to support US in particular, keeping up with current growth? Um, Zach, it's mainly in brand, digital, and what we've called global workforce. We're pursuing a partnership to open a, 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 an office in Mumbai with 150 seats imminently. Um, we're well progressed on that so that we can provide workforce to UK, US and Australian firms um, as workforce will, will become a global um, matter to be solved over the next decade. So we're making long dated investments there. We've invested very significantly digitally and it's come from our, our um, cash flows over the last two years. We're excited that we've taken what has been our defining client service experience um, that has been in written form and moved it into a digital format. Um, that's all been funded. It's begun its rollout. We have 44 clients on the platform. The, the senior team member leading in services, leading that program, who I'm very confident in, we're going to try and add hundreds of, of new clients from our 20% of best clients to that app and digital platform. Um, every quarter, we believe that if we have a strong sort of physical presence, a strong digital presence and a strong community, um, then uh, we can build something really special. Our clients wanna meet other clients um, and be part of the powerful um, relationships that we that we built up across, um, across the businesses. There's more than 17,000 client groups, it's 35,000 people. It's not an insignificant number of people. If you take 20% of them as your leading wholesale clients, um, it's three and a half or 7,000 people. Um, you know, there was a guy once who made quite an impact on the world. And I always say he had a few good stories and 12 disciples. So we've got some thousands of people that believe in what we're doing. And I, I think that that will prove to be a huge source of um, competitive advantage and value over time. Um, Ed Vesley, how much do you, time do you envisage before acquired subscale businesses achieve that EBITDA margin? We see it as a portfolio, Ed, and so, We'll work as quickly um, as we can on each of those businesses in partnership with the owner, um, uh, owner and owners 
um, operating owners of those businesses. Um, I think we've got a good track record of moving them through that growth profile, but we'll always be sticking businesses in um, that have got lower lower performance and, and improving them over time. We can improve them generally within 12 months. If they stay subscale, it's a little bit harder, but uh, um, uh, I must say I do spend other than Sundays every waking hour thinking about that, Ed. So um, uh, we're making good good traction there. And Kenny works with me on that very, very, very diligently. Um, uh, Ricardo Gonzalez, are there any updates on a potential US listing? It's never been a um, secret um, of mine to aspire to have a, a Berkshire Hathaway style structure listed in an appropriate market. Um, and we'll continue to, you know, vigorously pursue the right capital structure and, and listing for, for the group. Um, that's something that we, we just continually work on. And we'll give you updates as, as, as appropriate. Sebastian Campbell with new offices opening um, internationally. Can you speak to any concerns this, that this may be occurring too quickly? We'll put it another way. Why do you feel starting international expansion now will provide more real benefit to KPG than spending more time hardening your roots in Australia? Um, it's a good question, Sebastian, and I, and I can understand the um, uh, perhaps the reticence. I, I feel that we're on track to be a top 10 firm in Australia um, within two years, 24 months, maybe sooner. Um, the number nine firm would have 45, certainly 35% plus audit revenue. It's hard to know. We don't want to have audit revenue of that size. We believe we can continue to grow strongly. It's a little bit of a, you know, uh, I guess two part answer. One, we think we can walk and chew gum at the same time, but obviously we'll have to prove that. But, you know, if I was a betting person, you can't accuse me of not being invested. Um, and and second, you know, so I think we can we can do both. And secondly, I'll give you more of a sort of Zen, Zen style answer. Within our business, we have amazing senior leaders, many of whom have been with me for more than a decade. I want to, you know, essentially unleash them on the world, but I want to unlock for them the full value of their talent and opportunity um, so that they can live out their full capacity. So this is not about opening an office here or there. This is about taking our best talent and giving them the opportunity to grow themselves and therefore the business um, in, the, in the very best way. Um, we think that international expansion has a role to play in that. And as Jim Collins, you know, one of the, one of the people that I, that I love and admire, who I've never met, but I am going to meet next week, which is very exciting. You know, since inception of Kelly Partners, we've given every employee a copy of Good to Great, Jim Collins, you know, very famous management book. Um, Collins talks about having a big, hairy, audacious goal that's inspiring to your people. We have to be able to say to our best people, that there is no other place that can help them better realize their potential than KPG. I, I'm very passionate about that. I believe in our people. I want to see them be the best they can. And, um, you know, when I looked in the US in considerable detail in the UK, you know, our 31% EBITDA margin compares to essentially 8% in the US. Um, we think we can add some value here and in, 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 in the um, UK. So we'll see. Um, Trevor uh, Mukadizi, with the global expansion, um, will KPG also decentralize MA decision making to the teams on the ground? This is true, Trevor. We are, you know, I had an incredible session with a senior executive of Constellation Software at the Berkshire Hathaway meeting last May. He said to me, Brett, grab your best 10 or 15 senior leaders and invest in training, coaching and counselling them to be able to get out and grow the business. Um, we're putting a senior leadership council together. We're growing that capability. I'm confident in those people as scouts to go and find deals and our team to, to document and, and tidy up and make sure that, that we're bringing the right people into the business. I think we can have many of our senior people finding more deals and materially scale up our acquisition cadence um, in Australia, the US and the UK. Um, Brendan Harrington, hello, Brett and Kenneth, thanks for another great set of results. Uh, Brett, can you please elaborate on how you're approaching the management of your time and energy in order to realize a 25 year BHAG? 
Well, Brendan, uh, I plan my year in advance in color and then I book out all my holidays and pay for them. And then I set quarterly um, goals and put them into a monthly format and manage an ideal day. I try to do 10,000 steps a day. I gave up alcohol 18 months ago and I surround myself only with positive people. Um, not, not Pollyanna-ish types that tell you what you want to hear, but people that are looking for solutions that can do people rather than can't do people. Um, and I'm very much you know, looking to our senior people to deliver in their roles. Business has never been about me. While I do make a contribution, which I think is considerable, um, you know, the game at this point is to stay in the game every day and to do it across the, the next two 25-year plans. So I'm 48, 49 in um, August. I have a plan to age 50 and a plan to age 75 and a plan from 75 to 100. Um, so I intend that uh, in order to pursue those, staying healthy is a, a very high priority. Uh, that's not just physically, that's also mentally. It's very important to, you know, guard your mind and look after um, what goes into your brain um, to stay focused and, and positive. Um, and, I, and I have to say the biggest contributor to that are my family and the people I work closely with within our business and our amazing clients. Um, I, I really cannot um, uh, emphasise the joy that it is to come to work every day. Um, some people complain about their work. Uh, I, I'm more invigorated and love what we're doing um, every day than I ever have been. And we really are making every post a winner. So, um, you know, uh, um, thank you for the question, Brendan. And I hope that's a, a suitable answer. Um, Chinmoy Prusty, thanks for the presentation. Brett, what's your view on penetration of artificial intelligence, machine learning in all areas of life, including accounting? What do you reckon the major disruptions over the next decade are going to be? It's a great question, Chinmoy. I started at Pricewaterhouse when the first IBM computers went in and um, all the work was going to disappear. I think artificial and intelligence and machine learning will, will, will make a contribution, are making a contribution, and will continue to be um, uh, pretty exciting. Um, frankly, as accountants, I've spent my career 30 years having to do work that is really very much below the level of training that chartered accountants have always had. So I look forward to a lot of the dross being continually taken out of what we do day to day. But I know that the business that we're building for private business owners that have complex structures um, and looking forward that are multi-jurisdictional, um, these are the get up early, go home late, 24-7 um, types. Um, we believe they'll always value um, the quality of advice and insight that an organization like ours, A, can deliver today and can harness technology to even better deliver tomorrow. I would say that if we don't continue to reinvest our 9% and we don't look to the future, um, if we become what most of the industry are, certainly on an 80 to 20 basis, most firms are farmers. They haven't invested a cent in their business for a decade or more, and they're just taking... You know, they're doing what they did yesterday. And they're just taking whatever they can get away with. Uh, I think they'll be severely disrupted, which I'm looking forward to, to continuing to assist to deliver to them. Um, Anub Kaur, Brett, can you comment in terms of funding, um, terms and funding availability, acquisitions in the US and UK? Without giving too much of our secret sauce away, Anub, we've worked very hard to secure a um, banking relationship here in the US that we believe will deliver uh, the same or better funding terms then in Australia um, and we believe um, that we can do the same in the UK um, and we're involved in discussions um, to that end. Um, we're confident that, that there is um, huge interest in partner, partnering with us um, to fund what we need to do. Leon um, Poggioli, there's been a lot of news lately about automation and AI. Um, I refer you to my, my um, uh, response to just the earlier question. Um, Kieran Robinson, cheeky question, but as a retail investor, how do I go about calculating our share price? Well, as I've said before, and I think published, you, you read Robert Hagstrom's book, uh, The Warren Buffett Way. You get the first edition so that you can get the two-stage dividend dis discount model that he, that, he, that he shows you in one of the appendices. You stick that into Excel and you make a decision about an appropriate discount rate. 
appropriate growth rate. Um, we think that what we, so long as we continue to do what we've always done, which is buy into firms that are zero to 15 million in revenue, um, we believe that those transactions are as close to risk-free an activity that we can undertake. We don't see them defined as a risk-free activity, but when I started the group from day one, I always valued the group on the basis of the US 30-year treasury bond rate um, uh, with, a, with a growth rate that you know, uh, I, I have a view on. Um, you'll have to make your own uh, assessment of whether I look bored or not. Um, and whether our team look disengaged. Uh, but uh, I'm not bored and I don't think our team's disengaged. I think we'll continue to grow. But essentially, my mindset was that, you know, CEO's first job is chief risk officer. We should not engage in any transaction where we can lose capital. We should never forget that because rule ones don't lose money, rule twos don't lose money, rule threes don't lose money. And so if we remember that and we construct a very, um, intelligently and rigorously to ensure that our risk of capital loss is reduced to as close to zero as possible, then we reduce the systematic risk of our business. There might be many other risks, um, but we'll just control the ones that we can. And anyone who knows me knows that we're extremely aggressive about managing risk. Janelle, um, congrats on your personal development. It's admirable Stick to, to your resolutions. Thank you. Uh, my kind friend, um, I was asked recently by an investor, why do you publish these checklists and these books? Well, uh, as a team, we have a love of learning. We believe in its ability to improve people's lives as people and that when they come to work, you know, the only way to make a great professional is to first make a great person. Um, so we believe personal, personal development is professional development. Um, you know, and, and I don't think you can, you can as a senior leader say it if you're not prepared to do it. Um, so I've, you know, been very committed to trying, trying to improve my life and those of the people around me through, you know, continuous um, personal development. And I'm glad that um, you can see that. Those checklists, uh, you know, I shared with an investor recently, I published them to hold myself and our team accountable. It's just the way my brain works. If we promise to do something, we will spill blood to deliver what we've promised. And so by, by putting those, those books out, by putting those checklists out, we're just setting a standard for ourselves that we want to hold ourselves accountable to. That's that internal scoreboard thing. Um, Chim, I pressed you another question, if I may. How do you judge character and what's your definition of leadership? So for us, um, character is whether somebody's a person who is in the business of making other people better off. So what we call a person for others. Um, number two, whether they keep their promises. We, at Kelly Partners, we say whether they do what they say. And number three, whether they're convinced that a team can do more than an individual. So they are our three big judges of whether a person should join our team. And, you know, to me, fundamentally speak to the character of a person. Leadership's making other people better off as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's mostly about personal um, uh, self-sacrifice and taking on responsibility um, for, for the betterment of others. Um, it's not for everyone. Um, and it's certainly, you know, <sighs> some people have the, the, the right constitution, I guess, for, for doing that. Um, I love Collins' sort of level five leadership idea of, of, you know, you want a smart person that's humble and very, very determined. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's certainly my aspiration while claiming no, um, uh, no level of progress or perfection. As to scale consistently, I reckon you need to rely on a high quality leadership team. I'm quietly uh, confident in the quality of our leadership team. We have a, a, an unbelievable group of people and I'll emphasize it again. You know, when people walk through our businesses and meet our people, it's become very easy to get people to join our group. I say, hey, Call Ken, meet our team, arrange some meetings, Kenny, let them meet our partners and, and our people. If, if those people are excellent, just join our group if, if our people are excellent and have the types of values that resonate with you. Um, uh, you know, uh, we're doing incredibly well at, 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 getting people, um, at getting people to join. 
Janelle, a, a further question. A lot of vacancies open. We're recruiting at least half of the open vacancies at growth. It's probably 70% growth, 30% um, replacement. People move around. Our retention of our, of our best people is exceptional. We know that our top 10% of people contribute 90% of the result. Um, but that's not to disparage anyone else. We, we are a people focused, uh, you know, a right people focused organization. And I think we're doing really, really well at it. But we are growing a lot and we can produce more opportunity every day than necessarily um, the people that we can find. But, but we haven't given up finding them. And finally, Karen, with the global expansion plans, can we expect to see KPG having other share lists in foreign markets? Um, we will pursue a capital structure that makes the most sense uh, for the shareholders of the group in the long term. I've never um, walked away from, and, and frankly, have copped a fair bit of crap um, for having heroes in a hero-less world. I've been pretty clear about who my heroes are. I've normally got a cardboard cutout of him sitting behind me, um, but I get a bit of grief about that. Um, we think we've got the right heroes and that we're keeping the right company, that we've got the right ideas and that we're delivering the right actions, you know, developing the right habits and that ultimately, you know, point to, a, a, you know, a really um, significantly bright future. Um, so we'll do what, you know, we'll, we'll do what our heroes would encourage us to do and that is to do the right thing by, by our shareholders who are partners in our business um, to find the best way to create value um, with everything that exists within KPG today. We have incredible people, we have incredible intellectual property, incredible know-how, um, and we think that we should, you know, maximize the actual impact, positive impact that that can have on our partners, people, clients and communities, anywhere that we operate. So if I meet somebody who's got an excellent firm, that they've spilt blood most of their life building, and they believe um, that our group can help them and add value, um, they share our values, then I'm gonna help them because that's kind of my mindset and that's what I believe I'm, I'm sort of here to do. Um, uh, Graham Strong, as Charlie Munger says, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. Can you give us a bit of information about the incentives of the team that talked about earlier to assist with acquisitions? Graham, what we're working on and, and haven't signed off on it published and you know, I'm getting ahead of what I'm going to present to that team, but essentially a scout model where they'll get a 10-year a, a, um, a um, override on our 51%. 10% of that 51% is what I've got in mind, where 75% will go into a 10-year share pool for each of them and 25% will go to them each year in cash. We believe that over a decade we can build extraordinary value for um, what I'm, I'm calling these senior scouts. Um, people that go out and, and look for, you know, opportunity for the group and make the world better while continuing to deliver in their role. Um, so they'll be long-term aligned, all our partners since day one have signed 10 year agreements. They will, those incentives will absolutely reflect the values of our group. Um, Ed Best, if there's a US list of wood, Kelly partners remain listed in Australia. It's a great question um, and too technical for me at this point, Ed. I'm not sure um, would be the answer. Um, uh, but what we'll continue to do is we will continue to find ways to, to deliver the maximum impact that we can as a group um, to an industry that needs to change. And, you know, we think we're an organization that is most capable of leading that change. So they're lofty ambitions. We don't say much about them. We've tried to keep our presentation, you know, very um, uh, sober um, and, and moderate and, and balanced. Um, but if you ask me, you know, am I excited about the opportunities that are ahead for our group? Um, uh, I have never been more invigorated or energized by what we're doing we have never had better people within our group. We have never had um, a more aligned um, group of partners and team um, and, and senior people helping the business externally who really want to see us as an organization live up to our full potential. You know, when I was 22, I wrote a book 
and I, I, I would relate later that I met some people and they were like that breakfast cereal in Australia called Just Right. You tell them your hopes, dreams or aspirations and they'd say, you know, you're too young or you're too old. They never seem to be, you know, just the right time. You know, I have three children with my beautiful and amazingly supportive wife, Rebecca, and who are now 17, 15, and 10. And, you know, if we look back, there, were, there, were, there was never just the right time to start the group. There was never just the right time to have a child. If you ask any woman that's delivered a child, I'm not sure if they knew the full glory of that experience, they would uh, volunteer to do that at any particular time. Um, uh, and so, you know, when people say, well, what, what makes you think that now is just the right time um, for, you know, for trying to really unleash the full capacity of our partner group and our people um, by growing much more strongly in Australia and globally, I'm doing what I've always done, which is, you know, sniffing the, uh, the winds of opportunity and helping people fully maximize their potential, which will fully maximize the potential of the group. So um, we'll do that while we continue to do the right thing by all of the stakeholders in the business, um, uh, consistent with the values. And that I think that most of our people who know us well now are, are pretty comfortable um, have been um, pretty consistently delivered. Um, now, I've had a few people over the last few years tell me, oh, I can't buy the share price at $1, $2, $3, $4, $5. And it's too expensive. Uh, my job is to make it gobsmackingly expensive and make you, if you have sold our shares or don't own our shares, feel sick every day. Um, I'm here working for our people and our shareholders and, uh, and um, our clients and the communities that we operate in. And geez, we're having some fun doing that. Now, I, don't, I notice there are no further questions. Um, I'd love somebody to ask Kenny a question. Uh, I've got him here. He's in Hong Kong. Well, here we go. Um, somebody write, this question's for Ken, and I'm going to get Ken to answer one. Um, this one, Chinoy, uh, amongst your competitors or peers in accounting space like we're international, who, personal company, do you consider as gold standard? I, I have never hidden the fact that my business heroes uh, in the area of um, people, um, Disney, um, in the area of um, processes, Walmart, McDonald's, in the area of clients, Four Seasons, and Ritz-Carlton, in the area of finances, um, Warren Buffett, and Bernard Arnault, and Mark Leonard. So, no, I've never looked at accounting firms for inspiration, frankly. I went to a conference here in October in the US with 75 of the practice leaders of the top 400 accounting firms in the US. And it, it, it was um, very interesting, but, but not, um, not like sitting down and having lunch with, um, you know, uh, Warren Buffett or some similarly amazing um, um, business leader. Hey, Kenny, Zach Joyce has a question for you. Kenny, who are your business heroes, big fella? <laughs> business heroes oh, i have to say the same as brett like we i'm completely aligned with brett um warren buffett um really is 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 my business hero as well as well as 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 brett you know that's uh what we aspire to live in the the values that that he has conducted his business in is is really what we aspire to do so um that's warren's definitely my business hero Got another one for you, Kenny. Uh, congrats on being one of the first listed firms to announce in Australia. And guys, we think we're an accounting <laughs> firm. We want to do everything we can do on a world-class basis. Ken, I think three results in a row, your first the first or second. What's your secret sauce, KK, to, to making that happen? Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not me, guys. It's, uh, it's, my, it's my team. So it's, uh, it's a team effort, team effort. Uh, we, we push hard, we prepare early um in advance but it's also um uh the the consistency in what we do uh, we, we've got a focus in what we do we're focused on accounting firms which means that we don't have to account for this that or the other like it's a very it's a to be honest it's a very simple business so um uh you know having having done it for seven years now brett we've, we've kind of refined the processes um and with a with a very concerted and team um 
it's something that we'll be, we, we are able to achieve. So we're, we're very pleased about that as well. Awesome. Very cool. All right. Well, if there's no more uh, questions, but I am here. Um, I am intending to, to be quite hard to find over the next six months while we pull together some quite exciting initiatives. Um, going once, going twice. Well, Kenny, I think we've bored them all to sleep. Uh, it's a funny, it's a funny format that uh, we sort of speak to a screen and we can't see people. <laughs> so um, we miss that interaction. Um, but look, if at any time anyone's got, got any questions, we'll take the transcript from today and publish it. We'll work up some more um, Q and A's. We'll continue to publish our quality shareholders newsletters and, um, and make sure that uh, we just com communicate on a really transparent um, basis. We take very seriously the idea we've got 1300 shareholders um, and that we're in business with you as partners to grow something that really makes a difference to our people and our clients and the communities that we operate in over the long, long term. Um, and so I just want to thank everyone for being a shareholder um, and, and, and tell you how seriously we take that um, undertaking to you as we do, you know, to everyone else within our business. Um, I built really great relationships with tremendous people in our share register. You know, when I'm asked why be listed, I say, well, I wouldn't have these 1300 partners if, if we weren't many of whom give us intel from all over the world um, and bring us insights and ideas and free consulting and analysis on our business that we know has made the business better. Um, so yes, there's a, you know, there's a small financial cost to be listed, um, but we think there's a huge value transfer from our partner shareholders in making um, Kelly Partners Group Holdings a uh, better and better business every day. So with, um, with no more words from me, I want to thank everyone for their time and I look forward to chatting again soon. Um, as I love to say, have a great day.